My name is Barbara Bynum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the forum. This is going to be a really interesting presentation this morning. Um, our, our presenter is Gail Saunders, and I had a chance to visit with her a little bit. Her grandparents, great or great no, grandparents, grandparents um, immigrated from Italy to this area a uh, 100 years ago when the flu was going on. And so her family history, um, she says it's really, it really was interesting to talk to her grandparents about growing up in that time. Um, she herself was born in Ure. She is a student of history, having gone to college to study that, particularly with an emphasis on the Southwest. And so she comes to us today from the Ure County Historical Society. And she's gonna talk to us about a few specific remarkable women of the Old West um, and she is going to leave time at the end of her presentation for any <coughs> questions or because she welcomes comments today. We usually try and discourage comments, but she says usually people have something interesting to add, maybe about their own family's history and ties to the West. So let's give Gail a, a big welcome. Well, thank you for inviting me to teach today, or teach, I guess we'll better say lecture. Uh, March is Women's History Month. I became interested in women's history, especially while I was in university, and that was probably back in the Middle Ages now. When we used to learn about people who inhabited the Old West, we learned of men like Kit Carson, Chief Seattle, Doc Holliday, John, uh, John Evans, Leland Stanford, etc. But for the most part, not the lives of women. But in the years since I was a student, historians started looking more at women's history. They learned their stories from the journals they kept, from stories our grandmothers and great grandmothers told us, and from researchers. They were homemakers, caretakers, teachers, nurses, businesswomen, ranchers, doctors, lawyers, and writers. Now the Old West is a geography area. It's a time frame, a state of mind, and what is called the last frontier. For Americans, it was the, uh, the land west of the Mississippi. For the Canadians, probably Alberta and British Columbia will say. Uh, for the Spaniards and later the Mexicans, it was their northern borderlands. And for Native Americans, it was their homelands. They had lived here for thousands of years. Now we think of the 20th century as a time of great change. But the 19th century would rival any period in history. We can say that the Old West for Americans started about 1820, or some say maybe 1803 with the Lewis and Clark expeditions, and that it would end in 1912 with the addition of New Mexico and Arizona to the state, uh, or to the United States. Or some might say it was around 1914, the beginning of World War I. Most people have never heard of Teresita Sandoval, but she was one of Colorado's first pioneers. She was a woman between, a mestiza, half Spanish and half Native American. And she was also a woman between America and Mexico. She was born in 1811 in Taos, New Mexico. When she was 17, she married Manuel Suezo, and by the time she was 23, she had four children. The following year, the family moved to Mora, New Mexico, to settle a land grant. They stayed here for several years, but life took a sudden turn. While in Mora, Teresita met a man named Matthew Kincaid. He was from Kentucky, and he was a Mexican citizen, which wasn't that unusual at that time. Uh, they left. Uh, as he had his own uh, house, as he had his own land grant in the area. She left her husband, too, for Kincaid. In 1841, the Sandoval-Kincaid family 
moved to a new trading post called Fort El Pueblo, today the city of Pueblo. Kincaid was a fur trapper, and the couple traded uh, and raised buffalo. Sometimes this is called the age of forts. The photo here I have is a map of the Santa Fe Trail. A few years after moving to the fort, Matthew Kincaid left Sandoval for California. And in 1843, she and the British trader Alexander Barclay moved to a new settlement called Hardcastle, about 25 miles northwest of Pueblo. Later, Barclay took a position as bookkeeper and storekeeper in Bent's Fort. And I think you can see Bent's Fort on the Santa Fe Trail. Trappers and traders, as well as Native Americans, all met to do, to do business within its walls. Adventure at the fort, they say, was endless. Teresita knew and worked with some of the most famous characters on the western frontier. Mountain man Jim Berger, Uncle Dick Wooten, Kit Carson, and James Beckworth were all part of the scene. Life here was filled with hard labor, extreme weather, and retaliation by the many Plains Indian warriors defending their homelands. Then Barclay and Teresita moved back to Mora. Barclay built a fort on the Mora River, on the, uh, on the, still on the Santa Fe Trail, but this um, enterprise was unsuccessful. Teresita was unhappy, and she left him to return with her daughter, Cosita, and son-in-law, Joseph Simpson, to a ranch on the Arkansas River called Casablanca. When her son-in-law died, she took control of the property. She prevented the valuable lands from falling into the hands of rival cattlemen. The portrait that I first showed you was actually drawn by um, Alexander Barclay, and it's the only um, photo or representation of what she looked like. Now in 1848, at the end of the Mexican War, the ranch was now on U.S. soil. When Teresita Sandoval was a citizen of Mexico, she had rights that American women did not. She could freely in initiate divorce, and she could hold property and livestock in her own name. She could hold her own business interests, and the Mexican courts upheld these rights. It would be years before Anglo-American women would gain the rights that Mexican women enjoyed. Teresita remained a virtually independent woman until she died at the age of 83 in 1894. Sarah Winnemucca. Not much has been recorded on Native American women. As exceptions, historians have noted Sacagawea, who of course traveled with Lewis and Clark, Owl Woman, Owl Woman, the Cheyenne wife of William Ben, Chapita, and this woman, Sarah Winnebucca. She defended the rights of her tribe and all Native Americans while the federal government was forcefully relocating Indians to reservations. A writer and a lecturer, she wrote the first book in English by a Native American woman. In her own words, she wrote of her childhood and her birth near Humboldt Lake, Nevada. I was born somewhere near 1844, but I'm not sure of the precise time. I was a very small child when the first white people came to our country. They came like a lion, yes, like a roaring lion, and have continued so ever since, and I have never forgotten the first coming. Her birth name was Takme Tone, or Shellflower. She was the daughter of the Paiute chief, William II, or Winnemucca II, and uh, her, her grandfather then would have been uh, Winnemucca I. When he was called, the grandfather was called Chief Trunkey by John Fremont, who, uh, the man, the explorer that uh, led expeditions into not only Colorado, but into California. Sarah had a talent for languages. She could speak English, Spanish, two Native American languages, and her native Paiute. Her grandfather's wish for her was to be educated. After he died in 1860, 
Sarah and her sister attended St. Mary's Covenant School in San Jose, California. However, they were asked to leave after only one month as the parents did not want their children to go to school with an Indian. Soon after, the government relocated her tribe to Camp McDermott in northwest, Northeast Nevada and then to the Malheur Reservation in Oregon. During this time, self, uh, Sarah became self-educated and she began to teach. It was a time of starvation for the tribes. As conditions became more intolerable, some of the Paiutes joined the Bannocks uh, in raiding white settlements in search of food. The Paiutes and the Bannocks are distantly related. During what was called the Bannock Wars of 1878, Sarah served as an interpreter and a scout for the military while she tried to keep peace between the Paiutes and the U.S. government. After the conflict in 1879, 543 Paiutes and some Bannock warriors were marched to the Yakima Indian Reservation in the middle of winter, and Sarah accompanied, accompanied them. She was angered by the treatment of her people and unethical agents, and disease and famine, and, uh, famine during that march were rampant. In 1881, Sarah accepted a position at Fort Vancouver. This would have been near Vancouver, Washington, <coughs> and here served as an interpreter and a teacher. In 1883, she decided to act. She went on a lecture tour. She took her new husband, Lieutenant L. H. Hopkins, and first they traveled to San Francisco and later to the East Coast. She gave over 300 lectures up and down the East Coast, um, talking about Indian agents' mistreatment of her people and, qual and calling for equality. She usually spoke in her native, um, in her native costume. She collected a petition that had over a thousand signatures and she presented that petition to Rutherford B. Hayes. In 1883, she wrote an autobiography entitled Life Among the Paiutes, Their Wrongs and Claims. Her book was popular and the sales of that book paid for the tour. In 1884, Congress did pass a law which authorized giving land to the Paiute tribe but it was never carried out. Discouraged, Sarah returned to Nevada. She wrote, promises which like the wind were heard no more. When she got back, or when she returned to Nevada, she opened a school, but it, uh, was, it was forced to close because she ran out of money from the sale of her book. Um, I'll take a minute and let you re uh, read some of her quotes that are on the screen. Be kind to bad and good, for you don't know your own heart. The saddest day has gleam, gleams of light. The darkest wave hath breath foam beneath it, bright foam beneath it. There twinkles o'er the cloudiest night some stars to cheer it. the state of Nevada recognized Sarah by placing her statue in the U.S. Capitol's National Statuary Hall. If you look at this statue, you can see a shell flower in one hand and a book in the other. She wrote, I would place all of the Indians of Nevada on ships in our harbor, take them to New York, and land them there as immigrants, that they might be received with open arms and thus placed beyond the necessity of reservation help. In the mid-1880s, many miners, trappers, and Im immigrants would rather die than visit a woman physician. Male physicians, too, felt that the pr profession was no place for a woman. In fact, in the mid to late 1880s, saw fewer than 600 female physicians in the whole nation. 10% of these physicians practiced in the West. 
They say that courage is an understatement. Alice Reba Reynolds Ship. Alice lost five babies in 10 years. Their deaths inspired her career in medicine. She was born in Iowa in 1847. In 1852, her father drove a covered wagon to Utah to be closer to his Mormon faith. At the age of 12, she met Milford Ship. But uh, right after that, he was sent on a five-year mission. But she did marry him seven years later. Three more wives were eventually introduced to the home. Ellis had a love for, for medicine. She woke up three hours before her family to study medical journals. Her family encouraged her to attend medical school. In November of 1875, <coughs> she left Utah to enroll in Philadelphia Medical College. She was especially interested in children's diseases and obstetrics. Anxious to be home, she uh, completed that four-year program in three years. During her 50 years of practice, she delivered 6,000 babies. She shared her knowledge, too, by teaching fundamentals in nursing and obstetrics to women in five states. She died at the age of 92 in 1939. Nellie Maddie McKnight. In the spring of 1891, Nellie walked into a room of 35 male medical students who were preparing to dissect a cadaver. Neither the other male students nor her professors were happy to have her in class. She was born in 1873 in Pennsylvania. Her father decided he'd make, um, make his fortune in the gold mines of California. And he left Nellie and his wife with uh, her grandparents. She was, um, her grandmother was a proficient in herbal rem remedies. But unfortunately, she died of typhoid fever, and then Nellie's uncle died shortly afterwards. Then her mother died of an overdose of laudanum, an opiate-based drug. Her father finally sent for her, and she moved to California. There, she was an excellent student, and when she turned just 17, she enrolled in the Tolan Hall Medical College in San Francisco. She graduated with honors, after an internship where her patients were mainly Chinese immigrants, she learned how to competently stitch knife wounds, deliver babies, and, carry, and care for typhoid paper, uh, fever patients. While in Nevada, she met Guy Dole, another doctor. The two eventually married, and they practiced together for more than 20 years. She died in 1957 at the age of 40, uh, 84. Bethany Owens Adair. She was a bright child, but she had no opportunity to go to school. She was born in Missouri in 1840. Her father and eight siblings moved to, to Oregon three years later. By the time she was married, she'd been divorced and had a son, or by the time she was 18, she'd been married and divorced. A friend encouraged her to go to school. So, um, she attended school first with primary students while she was doing laundry at night to support herself. Then at the age of 21, she enrolled in high school and completed this coursework in nine months. Bethany borrowed medical books for local, from local physicians. First, she attended the Philadelphia Eclectic School of Medicine. These schools were popular in, in that time frame. They taught herbal medicine, mineral baths, and natural medicine. After graduation, she opened an office in Portland, and it was, it was successful. She was able to send her son to uh, medical school with, her, uh, with the money that she earned. But not satisfied with the knowledge, she enrolled in the University of Michigan. In 1880, she received her second degree. After returning home, she married John Adair, and the couple settled in Oregon. But still wanting to learn more, she enrolled in a Chicago medica medical school in 1889. 
She continued practicing until the age of 65. Lucy Hobbs Taylor became the first world, first woman in the world to obtain a Doctor of Dental Science degree. And it was a long and difficult struggle. The dental schools required applicants to have two years uh, experience as an apprentice in a dental practice before applying. It took her one year to find a dentist to agree to sponsor her. After her internship, she applied to the Ohio College of Dental Surgery, but her application was denied. But she continued to practice dentistry. Finally, at the age of 28, she had enough, she felt she had enough experience and knowledge, and she put her shingle out. At that time, you didn't have to have a dental degree to be a dentist. You had to, um, some, some of them were licensed, but some of them weren't. Her reputation spread, and in 1865, um, she was elected to the Ohio or Iowa State Dental Society. Her, peer, her peers petitioned the American Dental Association to allow her to be admitted to dental college. She completed her degree after uh, one year after she was finally admitted to the Ohio College of Dental Surgery. She married James Taylor, and they moved to Lawrence, Kansas. He became interested in dentistry, too, and he studied under his wife. And after he received his license, the couple practiced together until 1886. Susan Anderson. Well, Doc Susie is a well-known historical figure in Colorado. She practiced medicine in Fraser, landing there after she was looking for a place uh, that she thought would be helpful for her <coughs> tuberculosis. When she first got to Fraser, no one knew that she was a physician. She spent a year just trying to get her health back. She um, used diet and walking in snowshoes in the winter, and, and after a year she was well, or better anyway. Um, so a visitor came to Fraser and he knew her, and he told the people in Fraser that she was a doctor. So this began her medical practice. Her first patient was a horse. That wasn't uncommon at that time, as physicians also could serve as veterinarians as well. And she was known for her good stitching because uh, she was quite a crocheter. And she was known as the best diagnostician west of the divide. Um, doctors in Denver might consult with her if they had a patient they couldn't, um, they didn't know how to treat. So she practiced in Fraser, lived a long life, and she died in 1960. Flora Stan Stanford Hayward. She uh, was a Deadwoods, South Dakota's first woman physician. She earned her medical degree later in life. Almost 37 years old, she separated from her husband and took her young daughter, Emma, with her. She decided on South Dakota, too, because Emma had tuberculosis, and she thought the dry air would be, would be good for her. Um, in Deadwood, she treated patients from an office in her home, and you probably recognize some of the names of her patients. Wild Bill Hickok, Calamity Jane, and Buffalo Bill Cody. When her daughter's health continued to decline, she then again moved to California, thinking that that climate might be helpful. Shortly after Emma's funeral, she returned to Deadwood. In 1897, she became a homesteader, working on a ranch in Sundance, Wyoming. And she kept up her medical practice, seeing patients both in Sundance and in Deadwood. She died in 1901 at the age of 63. Mary Field was born a slave somewhere in Tennessee, and she was granted her freedom after her civil war, after the Civil War, but she didn't want to stay in the South. She had a friend that lived in Wyoming, and she headed to or Montana, actually, and she headed, uh, headed to Montana. To say that she was tall was an understatement. She was over six feet, 
and to say she was tough was an understatement too. She ended up in Cascade, Montana, at where she worked at a covenant, at a convent at St. Peter's, Missouri, at the St. Peter's Mission. They hired, hired Mary to help with the heavy work, uh, heavy workload. She hauled wood and water, fixed fences, and skilled with a hammer and saw. She did carpentry work too. Her biographer said she was gruff, um, that she liked to smoke and drink, and that she had a temper like no other. Stories have it that she got into a gunfight with one of the hired, other hired hands, and the bishop fired her. She worked in the covenant for over 10 years. After leaving the covenant, she opened a restaurant. The food was good and she had plenty of customers, but she went broke because she gave away too many meals to hard luck characters. When Mary was almost 60 years old, she got a, a job with the postal service as a mail carrier. She was almost, um, well, she got the job because she was the fastest applicant to hitch a team of six horses. This made her the second woman in the United States to work for the U.S. Postal Service. She never missed a day of carrying the mail. If it was too snowy, she put a pack on her back and carried it in snowshoes. Her mule, Moses, was her constant companion. Legend has it that she smoked a cigar and kept a jug of whiskey by her side. She was not slow to anger, and if she was egged on, a, fish, a fist fight might follow. The Great Falls Examiner, which was the only newspaper in that part of Montana, reported that she broke more noses than any other person in the state. At the age of 70, Mary, worn out from hauling mail, started a laundry business. By that time, she was well liked in Cascade as they say her gruff interior, exterior hid her kind interior. She babysat children and attended every home game the Cascade baseball team ever played. When her house burned in 1912, the townsfolk got together and built her another home. Mary died in 1914. Mary was so popular and well-liked in Cascade that the mayor made a proclamation to celebrate her birthday. Mary didn't know when she was born, so the town folks voted to celebrate her birthday twice a year, with schools closing and everyone given a day off work. She was also given permission to go to any saloon she wanted, a privilege no, one, no other woman in Cascade had. Well, the Klondike Gold Rush has the moniker of being the last great gold rush. When prospectors found gold nuggets near the town of Dawson City up the Yukon River, they bragged about their findings. First, when these men first came back from the gold fields, first in Seattle and then in, in uh, well, first in San Francisco and then in Seattle, reports of gold nuggets as big as peacock eggs hit the world's newspapers. The stampede was on. Now at that time, the U.S. was still in a pretty deep recession, and all manner of men, doctors, teachers, farmers, joined the melee. From 1896 through 1899, over a thousand men left their jobs, homes, and families on a quest to become rich. They were called stampeders, and they came from the United States, from Canada, and as far away as Europe. Most of the men were not physically prepared for the arduous journey they would face in the gold fields. Over 100,000 men then started the journey. 30,000 reached Dawson City. And of these 100,000, 1,500 were women. Now if you had the financial means, the easiest way to get to Dawson City would be to go around the Aleutian Islands, to land and then go across country through Alaska. But most of the men who made this journey didn't have the financial means, so they took a less costly route. They sailed up the inside passage 
to a place called Bayi, which was near Skagway, the port. Uh, here they purchased camping equipment, primitive backpacks, and food. They were required by the Canadian Mounties to have enough provisions to last a year. This would mean carrying about 800 to 1,000 pounds of equipment and food. They'd be hiking over rugged terrain and then sailing or rolling up lakes and rivers. In the fall of 1897, Emma Kelly contracted as a correspondent to report on the events of the Klondike, Klondike Gold Rush with various newspapers. Reporters saw, the, uh, saw this as a great story. Emma was acquainted with financiers who were wanting to get into the mining business, and they outfitted her with $2,000 cash to pay for expenses. I don't know if my math is right, but that's over $68,000 in today's money. In September 10, 1897, she left Topeka, Kansas with cold weather clothing, a Bowie knife, a shotgun, and a revolver. When she reached IE, she was told it was too late in the season that she shouldn't go until spring, but she carried on. She couldn't find any packers that would carry her goods, so she convinced some of the uh, sailors on the steamship to carry her goods for her. So the first stop was a 33-mile hike to, to sheep camp. There were hotels there where you could pay for the privilege of putting your bedroll out on the floor. There were gambling halls to take your money. And they rested here before the one half mile climb up the golden staircase to the top of Chilkoot Pass. She wrote, the trail from Dai to Sheep Camp, always terrible, was in wretched condition. The entire distance being through snow, slush, and muck, up sharp elevations, down precipitous canyons, and over rocks and boulders. When the water was too deep for me to wade, I would have a packer carry me over his back. At the top of the pass, they reached the border between Alaska and Canada. To get there, though, you had to scramble over scree and large boulders to reach the top. Um, in the better parts of the month, or the warmer parts of the month, native Tlingit Indians could be hired as packers, but otherwise you had to carry your own gear. This meant that some of these men made up to 20 trips up that pass to get all of their gear. <coughs> And at the top of the pass, right, at the top of the pass should be met by Canadian Mounties who made sure that you had enough food and gear to make the rest of the journey. They also confiscated whiskey and guns. The rest of the journey, a trip of about 600 miles, was downhill and most was made by water. When Emma reached Linden Lake, her packers left her with a thousand pounds of food and gear. If the stampeders didn't carry a boat up past, they needed to build one. Tent materials were used to fashion sails, and many spent the winters cutting down lumber, making planks, and building boats. To get on to Dawson City, Emma hired 22 men with three boats to let her travel along with them. Now, when they uh, started on the lakes in the boats, the Mounties marked each boat with a number so that they could keep track uh, of missing boats. It's not known how many boats were lost during this journey, but over 7,000 boats sailed. After the lakes, the lake area, they reached the Yukon River. Before arriving in Whitehorse, Prospectors faced two um, series of rapids. One was Miles Canyon, and the other was White Horse Rapids. Here again, the Mounties checked the boats uh, and oars before allowing them to travel through the steep canyons and difficult rapids. If the weather turned, those boats might crash into those um, assault cliffs. Emma was warned to portage, but she refused. I wanted to see and experience this so-called danger which men freely court, but which women may only read or hear of. 
Well, she made the first trip down the rapids, and then she decided that she wanted to go down again. So um, she took the next trip down, and this time, when she left the boat, while she was walking away from it, she slipped and fell 15 feet, cut her head, and passed out. The next set of rapids were at Whitehorse Canyon. She wrote, the rapids looked much more dangerous than those of the canyon. As for the ride through, I do not know when I ever enjoyed anything so much in my life. I snugly stowed myself away in the prow of a boat. The men got ready, the word was given, the line cast, and we were off. The wild waves rocked and rolled our boat and occasionally broke over us. The spray rose so thick and high we could not see the shore the very air seeming a sea of misty spray. It was simply glorious. All too soon we rode into a comparatively smooth yet rapid water. A few more strokes of the oars sent us to the shore and the ride was over, leaving a sensation never to be forgotten. When Emma reached da Dawson City on November 1st of 1897, she brought her fellow oarsmen a round of whiskey. She had a bath, probably a hot bath, and a good meal. The town of Dawson City had a, was a, a carnival atmosphere. In the wandering streets, makeshift saloons, noise, and commotion. About 20,000 people were in Dawson City in 1898. It was one of the largest cities in Canada. She joined other women who had weathered the journey. The women um, on the right are carrying uh, sewing machines. That was a way to make a living in a mining camp. They could become dance-off girls, or as some of the newspapers reported, we call them soil doves. Now, panning gold was not easy. Permafrost meant the ground was frozen. Some lit fires uh, to warm the ground so that they could use picks and so sho uh, shovels to scrape the dirt into gold pans, rockers, or seed boxes. Emma kept her readers informed of life on the gold fields, but she also had a side business. She was investing in these miners' claims, mining claims, and she reportedly made over $50,000. She wrote, the miners and all around here call me the Snookum Queen. I'm the only girl holding property on the gulch. The following is my address. Emma Leonotis Kelly, number five, above Bonanza Creek, Klondike District, Dawson City, Northwest Territory. Emma returned to Kansas about a year later. Uh, it's estimated that of all those men who reached Dawson City, only 4,500 found gold. But for the rest of their lives, they remembered this adventure as being the most exciting period of their lives. <coughs> Emma uh, returned then to Dawson City. She found the news in about a year. She found the city changed with banks, newspapers, and laws. Wives were beginning to arrive too. And then a gold strike hit Nome, Alaska, and some, many of the stampeders moved on. Big mining companies too were moving in. Emma Harris spent the rest of her life lecturing on the Klondike Gold Rush. Goldie Griffith Sterling Cameron. Now, Goldie didn't know how to ride a horse, but she knew she wanted to be in Buffalo Bill's Wild Rush show. She lived as one of the first professional female athletes. She was born in 1893 in Illinois, her father was a traveling medicine man, and Goldie and her mother performed songs and dances to draw potential customers to his wagon. The William F. Butley, uh, William F. Buffalo Bill Cody <coughs> opened his first Wild West show on May 19, 1883, near North Platte, Nebraska. It didn't take long for his show to become wildly popular. His attraction toured the, toured the country annually, 
and as many as 20,000 people might attend one of uh, his events. Cody was a soldier in the Civil War. He rode the Pony Express, and he got his nickname when he provided buffalo for meat to the Kansas Pacific Railroad workers. When stories of his wife were written up by East Coast reporters, he became famous. His show ran in fits and starts for over 30 years, and even took his uh, performances to Europe. These performances started outdoors, of course, with the parade around the arena, historic inspired battles, sharp shooting races, and Cody uh, rodeo style events. By 1908, his show was facing money problems, and he sold a third of his interest to the Pioneer or Pioneer Pawnee Girls Far East show. For five years, the two shows toured together. His cast could include over 500 people, including 25 cowboys and a dozen cowgirls. One of these cowgirls was Goldie. She, um, at the age of 17, she joined the Blanche Whitney Ladies Athletic <coughs> Wrestling Exhibitions, and she was billed as the first woman wrestler on the West Coast. This was shocking at that time. When she wasn't performing as an athlete, she performed in vaudeville acts with her mother, Allie. When Goldie saw her first Wild West show, uh, she was fortunate in that she went to convince the Millers brothers, the owner of the 101 Wild West show, that she should be in it, and he hired her. The cowgirls provided their own outfits. They sewed their own uniforms, so Goldie bought a hat so her new costume. Then she needed to learn to ride. Uh, Harry Walters, one of the bronc riding cowboys, gave her lessons. She was a quick study, and after a few falls, um, she, she learned to ride. She was a stunt gal, too, for some of Tom Mix's uh, silent films called Flickers. When the 101 Wild West tour ended, she received a telegram from Buffalo Bill Cody offering her a cowgirl position, but <coughs> she couldn't turn it down. When she arrived at the show in Philadelphia, Buffalo Bill greeted her personally. A week later, he called her to join him in his tent. He asked her if she wanted to marry Harry Walters. Sure, she said. So the ceremony was arranged. They were married in Madison Square Gardens, and the Wild West show followed uh, their marriage ceremony. Buffalo Bill gave her away. She made her dress out of buckskin, and the meeting was done by some of the Sioux Indians, by some of her Sioux Indian friends. When she was in New York, she took her horse, Popcorn, up to Grant's tomb, and Goldie rode her horse up the steps of the tomb to the cheering of crowds. Well, after the marriage, Goldie learned that Harry Walters was a stage name, that her new husband's name was really Harry Sterling. She also learned that Harry had a past, probably because he, keep, he kept disappearing for a few weeks at a time. Well, he was wanted in Texas for murder. He was tried seven times the last time he was sentenced to um, a five year suspended sentence. Goldie also learned that he had another wife in Texas. So when she, by that time she had a baby called Russell and she took her baby back to Denver um, just to kind of decide what she wanted to do next. When she found out he was in Denver, she took a pistol out of her stage prop trunk and shot at him. Fortunately, she missed. When he didn't show, when Harry didn't show up for the trial, the judge dismissed the case and charged Goldie one dollar for court fees. She said it later said that that was the best dollar she ever spent. <coughs> Um, 1913 then was the last year for Buffalo Bill Wild West shows. 
After that, Goldie hit the radio, uh, rodeo circus for a while, and she joined the Bill Penny Show. This was the last hurrah for Wild West shows, as the flickers or silent movies were taking over, becoming more popular. Some of her friends joined the circus, but Goldie was ready to settle down. So from here, she moved outside of Netherland, where she got a job on a ranch. Near, uh, this is near Boulder. Her second husband, which she married on the ranch, Doc Cameron, left her for another woman shortly after. She and her son, Russell, moved to town. And here she supported herself and Russell uh, by operating restaurants. Folks came for the good hamburgers and for her stories. While she was in Netherlands, she um, took, well, she was shown here with her saddle. She had a room in her house with all of her memorabilia. And she rode in parades in Netherlands. She's shown here in her wedding dress. Uh, and that wedding dress was, <laughs> was donated to uh, the Buffalo Bill Museum outside of Florida. And in 2005, her dress was on display at a special exhibit at the History of Colorado Museum. I think if we wait one second, Steve just left to go talk to the construction. It's good time. Yeah, let's hang on one second. I think he's going to ask that they can just wait a little bit longer. Okay. Um, the good news is that CMU is remodeling that front entryway and the restrooms. Um, the bad news is they want to start at 8 o'clock and we want them to start at 9. So I think Steve's out there negotiating. Okay, very let's, good. let's see if we can continue here. Thank you for your patience. So um, I guess I'm ready to end. The closing of the Buffalo Bill Wild West show was one marker at the end that showed the end of the Old West. The buffaloes were gone. Homestakers, barbed wire stopped the great cattle drives. Railroads crisscrossed the regions where wires were strung, communication was instant. The Indian tribes were all forced into reservations. Seattle, Los Angeles, and San Francisco were on their way to becoming great cities, and the last of the continental United States had been admitted to the Union. And the right to vote for women, first in Wyoming in 1889 and then nationwide in 1920, with the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And I had just one thing to add, kind of an aside. I actually knew Goldie. She was a friend of my mother's. And I can remember visiting her when I was a very young girl. And I told you about the room that she had with all of the memorabilia in it. Well, she told me that I could go into that room and that I could have anything that I wanted. Now, Goldie was a seamstress, too. She, was, she had sold, sold, sewed uniforms for the soldiers in World War II. And I chose a cloth envelope that was filled with embroidery floss. Had I known then her history, I probably would have chosen differently. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. This is really interesting. Um, what kind of questions or comments do we have this morning? Gail, you usually talk about the history of your reign or this area. What made you choose Remarkable Women? Well, um, I have been collecting stories of women, first in Colorado history, for a long time. And about three or four years ago, I decided it was time to branch out. So I started looking at women's stories in other sections of the West. But it's just something I've always done, Kathy. And I did, um, for over 10 years, I presented uh, talks at the uh, Ridgeway State Park and usually folks focused on Colorado women then. So this has been kind of, kind of fun to, to look at some, some other ladies. And it's for sure interesting. I, I grew up in California, and Camp Winnemucca was a big camp up in the Tahoe area, and I just never knew where that came from, clearly. Oh. So that was really fun. 
I'm not the only one thinking about my own grandparents and where they were born and what they did during those similar times. I also can't imagine that if, with the exception of her, all those women did all what they did without wearing jeans. Um, <laughs> and that's even more remarkable. And shoes that probably weren't meant to go hiking. I, uh, I take care of the photos for the museum. And I love looking at the pictures of women riding horses. Because when they're in town and around a group of men, they always ride side saddle. But boy, when they're up on those mountain passes, they're riding the other way. Yeah. Uh, what about children? My children? No. Goldie's <laughs> Goldie children? Uh, she had one son named Russell. He was um, he was in the um, World War II. I'm not sure what branch of service. And came home and uh, actually that picture that I had of her that's there in the middle when she was in the restaurant, I think I have, there was a photo of him on the countertop and I think I caught that photo out. So I, I don't know too much about him other than he uh, moved to California. Well, let's give Gail a big uh, thank you this morning.